Okay, hello, welcome back. I'm sorry we didn't have the music in that break, but we should have it in the next break. Um, our next speaker is John W. Smith III, who's giving a talk. John currently teaches at British Council Thailand, including IELTS preparation classes for upper secondary students. He has also taught students preparing for high stakes English. Hello, and welcome to my talk on IELTS preparation for upper secondary. Uh, when we talk about IELTS preparation, frequently what we're looking at is adults in the past. But nowadays, secondary students are being asked on top of their already very busy course loads to take on preparation for IELTS. Now, generally speaking, when we talked about IELTS in the past, there would be some secondary students, but usually those were only the elite students. Whereas nowadays, in universities all across the world, IELTS is becoming a standard and a requirement to get into not only English programs, but also programs that have any kind of English element. These could include medicine, business, uh, and even some standard humanities. Now, the big differences between these types of IELTS learners is that when we talk about adults, they have a much larger life experience pool to draw from. So there are some things that are easier to handle with them. Uh, they usually have a clear goal. Adults who are preparing for the IELTS frequently are studying so that they can get to a certain band score for immigration purposes, perhaps for a job, and in some cases for returning to uh, various study programs. Adult learners are also generally a bit more independent. Uh, they set their own schedules, they know what they want to learn, and because of the goals that they've set for themselves, they set the pace for how they're learning. Um, and also with adults, they have a lot of different responsibilities, family, friends, work, etc. Whereas when we talk about secondary students, one of the biggest hurdles they have is that they have very limited life experience. Uh, many of them haven't done much travel, they haven't had jobs, uh, and they have had sort of an insular experience in terms of dealing with outside social stimuli. On top of that, this is only one step on a long road for them. IELTS is a means to an end, generally, for secondary students. It's a step into university, which is then another step before they even begin what they're aiming towards. Secondary students are quite scheduling dependent because of parents, school, other responsibilities. So when we talk about IELTS for upper secondary, many times the courses from a teacher's perspective, look a lot like this. There's a general introduction to what IELTS is, and hopefully a certain degree of demystification. Frequently students come in and all they know about IELTS is the name. Uh, they know it's a big test, they know it's scary, uh, and all that really comes from that is a, a sense of distance and a sense of fear and demystifying a lot of that, showing them what the exam is and how it functions is something that can be very helpful for students. Beyond that, we begin with a lot of practice because the only way to improve at a lot of these tasks is through practice. And it also helps them to improve their general English. And going beyond that, we start looking at incremental increases in understanding. This is one of the most difficult parts for a lot of students because when we look at improving for IELTS, these aren't going to be big leaps. They aren't suddenly having, you know, a, a vocabulary that's twice its previous size. They don't suddenly have a much firmer grasp on all of the grammar points, forms, and aspects that they might need to use. But they do gain a little bit one step at a time. Now, for students, when they look at this, they often feel a bit intimidated. They might look at IELTS and just be like, what even is this? 
And then we're trying to explain it to them, and they say, why do I need to know this? Why do I need to know that the reading is 60 minutes and the listening is 40 minutes? Often there's a certain amount of discouragement once we start practicing too, because they feel a sense of the distance between the English level or English skill that they exhibit and the distance they think they need to achieve to hit the band score that they want on the IELTS. But once we get past that, once they're able to actually do the work and jump into it, they start to understand a little and they start to ask more and more questions. So getting them past the point of fear and misunderstanding and getting them into the work frequently helps our students to achieve a great deal more. So one of the most important things when we're designing these courses, preparing these courses, and getting ready to present these courses to our student, students is thinking about how can we meet expectations. The students have a specific expectation of what they can hope to achieve. And while we can't promise any specific marks, the one thing that we can say is that by going through these courses with us, they'll understand a great deal more about the assessment and be far more prepared. So one of the things I frequently talk about when, when I talk to other teachers about dealing with secondary students, regardless of the context, is don't discourage, but don't infantilize. This means not giving constant praise. We only want to give really positive feedback when something's been done absolutely correctly for this particular task. That doesn't mean that we should say, oh, that's wrong. Maybe use working a little bit more softly, like, that's a good idea, but what if we tried it this way? Designing approachable and scaffolded tasks is also important. Working one step at a time through each task will help students to be a lot more prepared and help them feel more comfortable with each step of the process. This is quite a large exam and preparing for it properly can take quite a long time. So as we're working on these tasks, we can't think about, okay, how do we get them to a maximum listening ability? It's more about looking at what small skills, what small abilities can we work on today? Giving realistic practice is important too, and we'll talk more about this later, but things like past papers that have been published by organizations like Cambridge uh, who are involved directly with the exam system is a good way to help our students to practice, even to make them aware that these things exist, give them a tool that they can work on. And again, setting narrow goals in class each day will help our students feel that sense of achievement one step at a time. So when we talk about avoiding discouragement, one thing that's important is to make sure students are ready for this. If students aren't up to a certain basic standard of general English, if they're not able to understand a lot of basic instructions on their own, they're probably not really ready to be preparing for IELTS and should be focusing more on their general English. Beyond that, our students should be made well aware of what instructions they need to be following and what's expected of them in the tasks. If they know what the goal is, if they know what an acceptable completion of a task is, they're going to be much more likely to achieve what they need to. One other thing I do is I like to avoid numbers early on, specifically with respect to grades. Uh, one thing I also like to avoid, outside of using the public band markers to give sort of general ideas of where students are at, I don't like to give specifics. Because if you tell a student, oh, this is at a 7, and they go and they take the exam and they come back with a, a 5 or a 6, they will blame you and possibly the organization you work for. And it's not really acceptable practice if you look into a lot of the, the public information out there on IELTS. But I also like to avoid giving marks, especially early on, because with weak students, it can be really discouraging if they feel like, oh, I got five marks right, and that puts me in really quite low. And with stronger students, if we, if we show them, oh, well, 
you seem ready for this, they might still be lacking in some places. So making sure that our students are getting the work, but not focused on numbers, helps them to focus on skill building. Giving continuous feedback in any setting is really important, but with this especially, because when we're looking at IELTS preparation and practice, we're talking about building these skills incrementally, and any cemented bad habits will continue on forward. This is especially important with things like writing and speaking, but for the others, following instruction. Offering clear direction is also very important in this so that the students know what they need to do to achieve their tasks. When I'm designing tasks for IELTS preparation courses, for materials and activities, I always like to start small. Rather than going into the writing full bore, which is 400 words, two very short sort of almost essay type tasks, instead starting small with a sentence or two sentences to complete one part of a task and building on that one step at a time. With really low level students, starting with sort of word building banks can be really helpful. It's important to make these things relevant, both to the students, but also to the context of the exam setting. When we look at past papers for IELTS and public information that's available for IELTS tests, some of the popular topics seem to be things like science, history, and so on. And thinking about those things, it can be really helpful to bring in local history or, or locally interesting science. Find out what they're studying in their current classes and find an adjacent topic. And you can design readings or listenings around that. Difficult is fine for these materials and tasks as well. Complicated really isn't. Looking at any of the IELTS stuff, and for anyone who's taken the IELTS, instructions are usually quite short and quite clear when we look at past papers. Uh, now, that doesn't mean the tasks aren't difficult, but they're set up in such a way that they should be easy to follow for most non-native English speakers. Now, one other thing I like to say is that fun is also fine when designing these things. But it needs to be fun that serves a purpose. One example of a task that we've done with, with students previously is something that I just call verb stories. It's quite straightforward. But this is focused on listening for specific details. For mid-level students, I give students a list of verbs. They work in a group, usually three, four students, to create a short story. And that story needs to include all of these verbs. But they can order the verbs however they want to within the story. Now, after they've created the story, there's a number of different ways to do this. One way I've done it in the past is to have one student from the group read the story for the class while the other students get a chance to act it out. And then the other students in the class listen and they're listening specifically for either the order of the verbs, if the verbs have been assigned, or if you're dealing with higher level students, you can let them choose their own verbs, and then the students have to listen for which verbs are being used in this story. This is just an example of one of the text boxes that I gave to students to create these stories. One of the important things here is that I allow them to use any tenses, any forms, any aspects they want. I do simplify it to tenses just to keep from confusing students. Uh, it, they don't need a ton of meta language to be able to, to take this exam. What they need are the skills to be able to use their English coherently and correctly. But for something like this, what's nice about this is when you mix up the verb sets, when you mix up the tenses, forms, etc., then students might be looking at a paper to see if they're getting the right verbs, but they have to listen very closely to make sure they're listening and hearing that correct verb, identifying that verb, even when it's being said differently from how it's being read. Now, another thing that I like to do with my students, and that's worked really well, is make your own speaking task one and three. Um, I tend to do something very different when we talk about speaking task two, 
because with the long term, there's a lot of preparation, there's a lot of time involved, and it's a lot of one-sided speaking. And because of that, doing more task one and task three related things can be quite helpful. I always encourage my students to speak for as long as they can. Um, but what we do here is I work with the class to create a short list of topics that seem like they might be relevant to this kind of conversation. Students then work in small groups to write questions based on each topic, not just one. So this takes a little bit of time. After they've created their questions, I set up groups in A's and B's. So if I had four groups, I would have two A groups and two B groups and set them up so that A's and B's talk to each other and rotate it around so that you don't have students in the same group interviewing each other with the same questions. Now, I tend to rotate students every four to five minutes to model the actual timings that are recommended for the IELTS exam. Now, two things that this does, one, it gets students speaking, but two, it puts students in the shoes of the examiner and often makes them feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, if you've ever tried something like this with your students and you see them sitting there as the examiner is like, oh, this, this is actually okay. Uh, they, fe they can feel that it's not an antagonistic thing, that it really is a much more conversational thing. But one of the important things when we're talking about topics is to choose topics with the class that are really their ideas, but that questions can be written on easily. I've had students in, in the past occasionally choose topics or develop topics that might not be very easy to write simple conversational questions for and didn't lead to a lot of real conversation. For example, uh, one class came up with the topic of water and we quickly had a, a chat about this talking about so what are some questions you can ask someone that might be personal about water because we're talking about task one and frequently that's going to be related to personal ideas personal stories now when we when we look at something like this we talk together and they really had difficulty coming up with questions so Instead, when we brought in environment, they were able to come up with quite a few questions. So one of the next things, after we come up with the topics, coming up with the questions. Now, I like to let students come up with their own questions, but it's important to monitor during this. This gives them an opportunity to make sure that their language is correct. And once they start getting into the examiner and candidate sort of space, if they're asking questions and those questions have incorrect grammar or lots of language mistakes, this can cause longer term problems. And that's something we want to try to avoid. So as long as they're hearing things correctly, it, it causes fewer issues. Now, one important thing is making sure the practice is realistic. This is why I recommend finding things like past papers or official sample tasks online. Um, I can't really recommend any unofficial things. I've seen some stuff that seems pretty okay, um, but generally speaking, official materials tend to work out a lot better because it models the genuine task very well and it creates expectations for the students. They know what to look for. Uh, something else when we're using things like this is that if I'm doing an actual practice exam, for example, listening, we would have the listening booklet, an audio, and an actual listening answer sheet so that it models real test practice. If we're just having them mark answers in the booklet, that doesn't prepare them for what the actual test is like. And there's a, there's a possibility that they'll get in there and think that that's the correct way to do things. Now, doing things that model the real task tends to decrease nervousness. Students walk in feeling a sense of preparedness and they know that they, this is a task they've done before and there's a lot less of a sense of, what is this? There's a sense of legitimacy to using past papers as well, as this is the foundation of what IELTS is now. This is what it has been built from to make it what it is today. So, using these kinds of materials help students feel like, oh, this is preparing me properly for this.
And also, going over the instructions and the question types that exist in the real exam, let students know what the structure and procedures are. And this helps them a great deal in saving time when they're preparing these sorts of things. Now, keeping daily goals narrowly focused is quite important because this gives a sense of iterative achievement. It might be small, but it tends to be important and adds up a lot over time. For example, if I'm setting goals, one thing I might set for a day is looking at listening parts one and two and looking specifically at true-false not given questions. Going over with students, what are some things you can look at when you're looking at these questions in advance? How can you maybe get an idea of what you need to listen for? Are there any answers you might be able to just cut out completely or see as less likely just by looking at the question? Something like reading part two is a good place to look at matching the topic to a paragraph. This is, again, it's something that's really small, but once students achieve this once or twice, they get a good, firm understanding of how this works, and it builds that confidence, which is an important part of this. And then for things like the writing tasks, especially task one, giving them examples of a few graphs, tables, charts, and having them write just one or two sentences on this to get them in the habit of how these processes work can be really quite helpful for students. So when we're talking about meeting expectations for students, when we want to engage our students, offering encouragement through accomplishment, letting them hit those tasks, pull off those tasks themselves. When they do things for themselves, they gain a lot more than when we do things for them. Because when they're in that room, we won't be there to help them out. We also want to focus on scaffolded tasks and activities, small steps to reach bigger goals. Much of the IELTS can be broken down into pieces. Now, also remember, past papers can be quite helpful for preparing your students. And those small goals build over time. And if we're looking at a six month or one year program, this can be a major gain for our students. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that you have now. Okay. I thought I saw. Ah, so it's, uh, how many classes does it take to prepare them for the exam on average? Um, one thing that I have heard repeated over and over again uh, is that, for example, uh, getting up to a band five takes quite a long time in terms of practice. To go from a band four to a band five, I've often heard, takes about a year of study and practice. Um, going beyond a band five into a band six, it's closer to six months to a year per half band beyond band five. And that's just what I've heard. I don't have exact numbers or, or data on that. Uh, how do you simplify teaching writing part one, especially with complicated charts? When we look at some of these charts, what we want to do is focus on things that the students can, can really latch onto. One thing that I like to do, if it's a chart that involves numbers or a table that involves numbers, look first for the biggest thing and the smallest thing, because those are really easy to offer simple, straightforward superlatives for. Outside of that, we can just pick two random things. As long as they can be compared, then we can start working on some simple comparatives. The other thing that I like to focus on with this is getting things started going. Um, one important part with that is paraphrasing instead of just spitting out the, the topic verbatim or the question verbatim. So working on those things one piece at a time uh, can be helpful for students. Because mostly the focus of task one is on reporting facts. And not just reporting the facts that are there, but looking at what's there, analyzing it, and making decisions. And that frequently leans into things like comparatives, superlatives, and simple paraphrasing.
So how can we help students who have less life experience? This is especially difficult when we start talking about things like the speaking. Um, because they're, they're, they're dealing with things very spontaneously, as well as writing task two, where they have to offer an opinion. One of the things that I like to do with, with both of these things, with, with anything that involves life experience, is to sit down and talk about, have them talk about their personal stories from life, to try to link what they do have into what might be going on here. Uh, one of the things that I've I've done frequently as a practice for writing task two uh, is to ask them the question, do you think all secondary students should be required to wear uniforms? And it's something they're very passionate about. And when they write about that, it shows them that they have a lot of those structures. All they need to do is figure out, okay, how do I feel about this? So when we're looking at how we can make this, how, how we can show them that they do have enough experience to answer these questions. Um, part of that can be, in the personal questions, a little bit of diversion is okay. Bringing something back to where you can talk about things while staying on topic, of course. So, for example, um, if there was a question about uh, what do you like about your job, uh, they, they might be like, well, I don't work. And that would be the end of their response. But we can show them, like, you can say, I don't have a job. However, I am a student, and much of what I do prepares me for work. Here's some of the things I've done that I think will prepare me for a career in the future. So using what they have, even when it's limited, uh, and getting them to talk those things out is really it helps build that confidence and that sense of, okay, I now have strategies for approaching these things. Do I work on students' vocab and grammar in special sessions to raise IELTS students' level? I tend not to focus too much on vocab and grammar. Um, with respect to grammar, uh, I do try to do some things with writing. One thing with writing that's worked really well in the past uh, has been uh, what I call sentence scaffolding. You give a very simple sentence, and then you, uh, there's another name for this, I don't know the actual name, but you start with a very simple sentence, I go to the store. And then underneath that, you can have either a change or an addition. I'm going to say, add an adjective, then I go to the grocery store. Uh, then we can add in the next one, uh, change the verb to past simple. I went to the grocery store. And it keeps building and building. And as you build on that, they wind up using more grammar, seeing how larger sentence structures work, um, and designing these things for themselves. But it also gives them a chance to use their own ideas. You're not prescribing what they're writing. You're just helping them along in figuring out what might be the parts of speech that would make this sentence a little bit broader and showing them how they can do that with almost any sentence. And then they can apply that to their own writing and even their own speaking. So yeah, as far as vocab, I try to add that a little bit more organically. Uh, that comes in through, through doing reading tasks um, and from doing basic writing tasks. A lot of times at the beginning of my classes, we'll do 10 to 15 minutes of independent journal writing. And when they're doing that, uh, I'm allowing them to use their phones only so that they can look up words that they might not be sure about. Uh, today we talked about what did you do over the holiday. And they were trying to figure out, OK, how do I say that I went to this specific festival and saw this specific thing? And they can go and find that. And then they've sought that vocabulary out instead of me trying to tell them what vocabulary to use. Because there really isn't going to be a prescribed vocabulary or grammar. And largely, the grammar from past papers isn't insanely complex. So. Okay. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, thank you so much, John. That was a really useful talk. I think useful even for non-IELTS teachers. I don't actually teach IELTS at the moment, but I think there are so many ideas there that I'm going to use or uh, different ways of thinking about how to encourage students and engage them. So um, I hope some of our non-IELTS teachers stuck around for your webinar because I think there was uh, useful stuff for all of us there. So thank you so much for that. It was really useful. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, we are going to have another 10 minute break now. We'll be back with Anna Maria in 10 minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, see you soon.